Welcome to the fifth edition of Voxiversity. This is 5.2, Inflation Defined, Keynesian Edition. And today I'm going to be talking about the Keynesian definition of inflation. Keynesian economics is one of the two major aspects of modern mainstream economics. It's been around since the 1930s, more or less. It was initially created by John Maynard Keynes in his book, The General Theory. And it was then adapted into a quantifiable form that uh, produces all of the various statistics with which we're familiar by Paul Samuelson in his 1948 uh, textbook, Economics. Now, there's several definitions of inflation within the broader Keynesian ages. And uh, we'll start with the one that we talked about last week, which is Paul Samuelson's definition, saying by inflation we mean a period of generally rising prices. Now the BLS, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, which actually produces the Consumer Price Index, which is one of the various indices that purport to measure those rising prices, defines inflation as the overall general upward price movement of goods and services in an economy. So again, you see the focus is on prices. That's not, however, the way that John Maynard Keynes himself defined inflation. In the general theory of employment, interest, and money, he said, when full employment is reached, any attempt to increase investment still further will set up a tendency in money prices to rise without limit, irrespective of the marginal propensity consumed, i.e., we shall have reached a state of true inflation. Up to this point, however, rising prices will be associated with an increasing aggregate real income. So if we translate that into uh, more straightforward terms, uh, the theoretical definition of inflation, as provided by Keynes himself, is that inflation is an attempt to increase investment in a period of full employment. That means there can be no inflation while there is unemployment. And in periods of non-full employment, rising prices indicate rising total real income, ergo no inflation. Now, the problem with this is uh, pretty clear, and it's why Keynesian economics began to fall out of favor in the 1970s. If we look at the uh, index of prices provided by the CPIU from 1960 to uh, 2010, we can see that with a, a small exception in 2008, there's a, a strong implication that there was no inflation. However, once we take the U3 unemployment rate into account, it's quite clear that that's not the case. Now this was a major problem for Keynesian economists and uh, they got rightly hammered over it by, the, by Milton Friedman and the monetarists. So what they developed was a concept called full employment. And full employment is little more than a fudge factor. You'll see these all over the place in Keynesianism, unfortunately. But uh, full employment is the idea that uh, there can be full employment within an economy. Everyone, uh, everyone can be working with an economy even though there is unemployment. So they come up with various reasons to account for this. Everything from friction to people being in between jobs and so forth. But the reality is it's, it's simply something that they assign in order to try to account for the fact that the statistics are not in line with the theory. So you can see here back in the late 60s, this was briefly convincing. This is a chart uh, with uh, the U3 subtracting the 4% that I was taught was uh, full employment back when I was studying uh, Econ 101. And however, it, you know, that, that excuse fell apart fairly rapidly. And as Wikipedia notes, uh, economists have claimed that full employment is anything from between 2% and 13% unemployment, which uh, usually just indicates how much fudge factor they needed. So the theoretical definition of inflation provided by Keynes is, is clearly wrong. Now let's look at the official definition from the BLS, uh, which can be summarized as saying inflation is when prices are generally rising. Well, it's pretty easy for anyone who's ever even studied Economics 101 to think of an occasion that prices rise. That's when you know, the old uh, law of supply and demand, when demand rises and supply remains constant. It's the classic SD curve, uh, the, the demand curve shifting out from D1 to D2. Supply remains constant uh, on the curve and therefore prices rise from P1 to P2. Is that inflation? No, 
Of course not. It's it's simply the the law of supply and demand in operation. So we really don't have any choice but to toss out the official definition as well. That still leaves two more definitions though. We've got Samuelson's textbook definition, which I've simplified somewhat by saying inflation is a period of time when prices rise because total money spending is increasing faster than the amount of goods being sold is. The practical definition, if you talk to someone who's reasonably economically astute, they'll tell you that inflation is a general increase in prices that exceeds the increase in goods produced and services provided. Those two definitions are not precisely the same, but they're close enough and actually we can we can address them using exactly the same uh, technique. If you think about it, how do we measure uh, goods produced and services provided? Or alternatively, how do we measure total money spending in the economy? It's the same, it's the same uh, measure. It's gross domestic product, GDP, which is a meant to be a measure of the total market value of all final goods and services produced in a country in a given year. It consists of C plus I plus G plus X minus M, which is uh, consumer spending, investment, and government spending, plus uh, exports minus imports. So because it represents both the, the total goods and services uh, measured in money, uh, that means that GDP is a reasonable way for us to address both these definitions. And furthermore, uh, GDP is always how these measures are, are in fact accounted for by Keynesian economists. So let's look at, at GDP. Remember, we're, we're just going to, at this point, uh, we'll just stick with the practical definition for now. Uh, inflation being a general increase in prices that exceeds the increase in goods and services. Here we have the GDP from 1960 to 2010, so we've got 50 years of the growth rate, uh, uh, the rate of increase in goods and services. CPIU being the uh, index of the price changes, uh, we showed last week that it's not accurate, but we'll stick with the, the actual measure here for now just to keep it simple. And what's very clear is that the increase in prices does not exceed the increase in goods produced and services provided. Therefore, both those definitions uh, have to be wrong. That either there has been very, very little inflation, and we've been in a massive deflationary period over the last 50 years, or the definition is incorrect. Here is the difference between the, the increase in prices and the uh, increase in goods and services. Uh, and if this is inflation, then there is none. Actually, what we have is a considerable deflation over the last 50 years. And that quite clearly has not been the case. Now, the astute observer will say, hey, wait a minute. Uh, I, I see those numbers, and the average is well north of, of 5%. So uh, when we hear about GDP reports, they're usually coming in around 2 or 3 on average. So I must be using nominal GDP. And that's correct. Nominal GDP is the current account, or the, the current dollar gross domestic product. And that is as opposed to real GDP, which accounts for supposedly inflation. However, the, the way that the real GDP accounts for inflation, supposedly, is by using an imputed measure called the GDP deflator. It is not a measure of price, prices. Um, it is not uh, it's, it's a weighted measure that changes every year, and in fact it's, it's a combination of deflators from various portions of the economy. So it's not an actual measure of prices. Now it's fairly similar to the CPI, in fact we can see the yellow line here being the GDP deflator is fairly similar to the, the red line of the CPI, but if you actually average it out, uh, you find that the uh, GDP deflator uh, tends to average about half a percent lower than the CPI over time. So uh, comparing real GDP to the CPI is not correct because you're not actually accounting for prices. How do you account for prices? Well, it's pretty simple. Instead of the real GDP, let's calculate something called actual GDP, which would be nominal GDP, which is the light blue line, being corrected uh, by the CPI. So now we have an actual uh, 
uh, correction of the prices to the extent that that's accurate. That gives us actual GDP, which is the dark blue line. Now that looks a little bit more reasonable. Uh, it's showing, it's showing uh, some some recessions where uh, where real GDP didn't. That's actually good in in some cases. For example, in 2000, uh, the the current real GDP figures show that there never was a recession that you know all of us remember actually existed. So let's now take a look at how this actual GDP compares to uh, to the red line of the prices and this green line therefore represents inflation which is the, the prices over the actual GDP and it looks fairly reasonable in that we can see that you know the the line is is well above zero in numerous places as you'd expect but not quite as not quite as much as as you'd think of the last 50 years 23 of those years have been in deflation if we're using Samuelson's definition periods of time where it's where the, the prices uh, are lower than the increase in goods and services then we've actually seen quite a bit of deflation over the past 50 years but that's really not the major problem the major problem you can see if you simply look at the form of the two lines they're mirror images and so what that tells us is that if we take these two definitions of inflation uh, seriously at face value then what inflation actually is is economic contraction because when the uh, when the growth of goods and services like for example here in the 60s exceeds the prices then we have uh, a we have deflation where it's so therefore economic growth is being directly correlated with deflation on the other side when the when we have positive inflation up here in the uh, middle uh, middle 70s and, and the early 80s then again we have uh, growth rates that are south of the the zero percent line and so what that means is the effective practical and textbook definitions are basically saying that inflation is economic contraction and deflation is economic growth and so uh, now we could argue that this is, is an artifact that's being caused by the statistical measures that have been created by the Keynesian e economists and, and there's a legitimate point to be made there but uh, the more important conclusion and I think the correct one is to see that is to see that um, the definitions are trivially true and therefore uh, irrelevant and you know if we're simply going to say that all economic growth is deflation and all economic uh, uh, contraction is inflation you know we, we've simply turned it into an unusable and unimportant concept so in conclusion the theoretical definition is incorrect the official definition is incorrect and both the textbook and practical definitions of inflation are also incorrect Next time I'm going to be taking a look at Milton Friedman and the monetarist definition of inflation. We'll get into velocity and, and all that sort of thing. And we'll see how they fare, see if they fare any better.